Would you take out your notes this morning, or this afternoon? I'm continuing a series entitled Marriage Matters, and I want to look at the second installment today of the five love needs of a man. Would you read out loud with me in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21? Let's read that together. Let's begin. And further, you will submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is the key to all relationships. And for our series, Marriage Matters, one of the main ways that we who are married learn to submit, we learn to surrender to one another, is built in becoming an expert, a student of your wife, a student of your husband, and becoming an expert in being able to meet their needs. This is where you commit yourself to mastering your spouse's needs and you meet them every day day. Now, loved ones, I'm telling you, if we will do this, I believe we can see the end of divorce in our own church, in our own uh, community, and in our culture. I believe we will see domestic abuse, we'll see um, sexual abuse, emotional, relational neglect recede. Now, do you believe that's a worthy goal for us in our decade of destiny for the next 10 years? I think it is, and I think it's very possible to see this happen. We can see heaven on earth in our marriages, in our families, if you're single, in your relationships and friendships, if we will adopt this biblical perspective. I'd like to encourage every one of you to get the book, Dr. Gary and Barbara Rosberg's The Five Love Needs of Men and Women. Again, whether you're married, whether you're single, whether you're divorced, whether you're wanting maybe one day to be married, this is the key to successful relationships. It's really simple. Find out what the the woman's needs are, find out what the men's needs are, and then be willing to meet them. And just quick review, the five needs of a woman that we looked at two weeks ago are these. Number one, unconditional love. Number two, a woman spells intimacy through talk. I'll talk a little more about that. Spiritual intimacy is their number third need. Encouragement is number four. And friendship is number five. Today what I'd like to do is pick up where we started last week. We looked at the first two love needs of a man. You can look at your notes, point one and point two. If you'll notice, like the woman, the man's first need is unconditional love. And we discussed because... God has made us neurologically, biologically, psychologically different. We have the same need of unconditional love, but it will be expressed and experienced differently. And like the woman, a man's second need is intimacy. But where a woman will spell it as talk, a man will communicate it as sex, sexual intimacy. And I uh, told you last week that up to 90% of a man's masculinity is tied in with his sexuality. So when a man's sexuality is met in marriage with his wife and it comes out of a mature relationship and where the two are growing, a man's sexuality actually becomes a very profound asset, not only to himself, but to his wife, to his children, to his church family, and to his culture. Please hear that. What we're seeing now in our culture is what I call male sexuality gone wild. What do I mean by that? One of the reasons for the sexual confusion that is destroying our culture is that much, most men have not known how to properly get the sexual need met. And men, can I just say this? It is our responsibility in our relationships to love our wives, and to lead our wives, especially in this area. Because this is a very tricky area. It's a very intimate area. And depending on what kind of experience uh, your spouse has had, especially if she has sexual abuse in her background, whether it's through incest, whether it's through rape, whether it's through lots of premarital uh, sexual experiences, there is a lot of leadership. There's a lot of sacrificial life and love that has to be manifested so that there can be this 
healthy, healthy expression. Here's the problem. And I think it lies at the responsibility of the church. That because of men, through our own infidelity, through our own adultery, through affairs, through prostitution, through rape, through incest, through pornography, the traditional family has been absolutely decimated. And please hear me. I think because the church, church leaders, pastors, Christian males, we've not been honest about going after this situation, the proliferation of gender confusion that has led to our obsession with sex, same-sex attraction and transgender issues is because of this not understanding, uh, I think, of male sexuality and how it needs to be expressed through marriage in a godly relationship. Now, I've just said a mouthful. I'm calling for a godly sexual revolution that begins in the church. And what does that mean? That men and women understand how important our sexuality is. That means if we're single, we understand the importance of being able to keep our morals strong. It means how we conduct ourselves uh, with the opposite sex and with the same sex. And that those of us in marriage that we make sure that we're growing and that we understand what our spouse's needs are so that the sexual relationship is strong. As long as Kathy and I continue to pastor this church, you're gonna hear me say this over and over and over. There's more of a need for our children. There's more of a need for our culture to see Christian marriages that have good, strong, passionate love life. Now, that does not mean that we're going to uh, do ads and tell people how great we're doing. But my point is, if I was to ask most couples, how's your sexual relationship? If they're even honest enough to respond, there's not a whole lot going on. And it is more important than we know. So I'm committed to you for the rest of our time here at this church. We've committed to 2020 that I want to see as we're going to step up our ability to minister to marrieds and to help anyone who wants help to grow in this area. So my next two teachings are going to be extremely timely. Next week I'm speaking on the sex needs of a woman and the next uh, week will be the sex needs of a man. Now if you think maybe I'm just obsessed and I have a problem, I don't. I'm a very healthy guy, okay? You talk to my wife, we're doing good. <laughs> Listen, I can't tell you how proud I am of so many of you. I'm getting letters, I'm getting emails from wives and husbands who said, even though you dealt with it for 28 minutes, we're taking what you're saying and we're starting to apply it in our marriage and things are starting to break open and change for the good. If you will act on this in appropriate, appropriate ways, it will work. So let's start with the third love need of a man. Look at number three. How to meet your husband's, a man's need for friendship. The lonely American male is well documented. Most men do not have the kind of relationships where he can lower his guard, not have to be in control, and he can learn to be honest, and he can learn to be vulnerable, and he can learn to trust. And I would suggest for many of us, if you find yourself overwhelmed with your hurts, habits, and hangups, our Celebrate Recovery Ministry is a wonderful opportunity to go and to meet other men, to get in a small group with men that might be struggling in the same area you're struggling with. And uh, we always see that when guys begin to be open and they begin to let their cracks show in their hearts and they begin to be honest, that's when healing can begin to come. You, we all need this in our relationship. Well, what does this have to do with women and wives? Wives, you're in a unique place to meet one of your husband's deepest needs, and that is a friendship. Look at letter A. What does your husband need in a friendship with you? In this need, husbands, this is what we're basically saying to you as our wives. I need you as my most trusted companion. Kathy, if you don't, those of you, if you're new, you don't know she's, can you just raise your hand? This is Kathy, my lovely wife. 
I need her. I haven't always been aware of how much I needed her to be my trusted companion. I wasn't aware. If you asked me, do you need a best friend? I'd say no. I don't need a best friend. I need multiple friends. And that's true. But I do have the need of a best friend. She is my counterpart. She is my soulmate. And this is really beginning to be awakened in me that I need to pursue her uh, in that way and to make sure that she knows that. Look at number one. Here's what he needs from you <clears throat> in friendship. To have a real, a realistic expectation of him. This means that it's important to understand that your husband is not going to be one of your girlfriends. I know this sounds kind of funny, doesn't it? But I've heard women say, oh, if he could just be like one of my bestie girlfriends. No, you don't want him to be like that. Because he would have to become something he's not. He would have to become more feminine. We're not supposed to become feminine. We're men. And from a male's side, I need to learn to be empathic. From a male's side, I need to learn to listen. From a male's side, I need to learn how to express compassion. But would you agree with me? Compassion is communicated differently than when a woman communicates it than when a man does. And we need feminine compassion. We need masculine compassion. And when they work together, they work as complements. Nothing's more powerful. Recently, um, Kathy and I were just laying in bed talking, and it was our day off, and Whitney pops into the room. So Kathy says, well, come lay in bed with us. You know, I go, whoa. <laughs> I wasn't quite ready for that, but she did. She came, just laid right in between us. We started to massage her. We started to talk. It ended up in one of the more powerful prayer times that we've had for her. Wouldn't you agree? We just had a chance to lay our hands, and here she comes into the inner sanctum, into our bedroom, and we're able to lay our hands on her and bless her. It was so powerful. And what happens was we were taking our friendship and then in extending it to her. But women, you need to have real, realistic expectations of your man. Look at uh, Proverbs 19.9. Would you read that out loud with me? Let's begin. It's better to live alone in the corner of an attic than with a quarrelsome wife in a lovely home. Today's translation, it's better to live in the corner of an attic or in my cave than to be with a woman who's going to nag me all the time. It's just like, it, I wish I, I should have put a little thing of that up. It's like dragging fingernails across the blackboard. And for us guys, it just kills us. If Kathy starts to nag, I just, I do not want to hear it. Guys, the reason our wives nag, if you're not aware of her five needs and you're not meeting them, you're going to get nagging. You just are. So if you're meeting your wife's five love needs, women, you're really wise. You're a wise woman when you have realistic expectations of your husband. In other words, he can't meet all of your deepest needs. Jesus can, but he can't. Look at number two. Learn to speak the truth in love to him. Speak the truth in love. Would you read out loud with me Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15? Let's read that together. Instead, we will speak the truth in love growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. If you read that whole scripture in context, he's talking about apostles, prophets, pastors, the, the, the gifts that he's given to the local church and leadership. And the reason is it's to help us learn to speak the truth and love to each other because that's how we grow. Now, would you agree with me? It is very difficult for most of us to have to receive truth from people. It's very difficult. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, I'm, I don't like to be corrected that much, but I have a need to be corrected. So why is it so important if you're going to speak to your husband, it's so important to speak the truth in love. Uh, we, Kathy and I were going to a meeting recently and, and she looked over at me and she said, can I make a couple suggestions? Now that's code for, I would like to speak the truth and love to you. What she's really saying is, 
I'd like to see you make some changes so you don't make some of the same mistakes I'm seeing you make on a regular basis. But she did it in a very nice way. Uh, Kathy's emphasizing with me in our relationship, we need to make requests, not make demands. Anybody here, you really thrive it on when people make a demand of you? We don't. I mean, no, no, you hear what I'm saying? If I say, you have to do this, if I make a demand, we, we usually don't do the best with that. But if we'll make suggestions, we're gonna be more open to hearing. She gave me several suggestions, and the meeting went off with no hitches. It was perfect. She was speaking the truth in love to me. Does this make sense? Someone wrote me recently and said, I need to challenge you on something. And when we sat down, I said, I want you to know what you wrote was right, but I'm gonna respond better if you would have said to me, I'd like to support you. I wanna encourage you to be the best you can in this area. Do you feel the difference between support and encourage and I'm gonna challenge you? You know, I'm gonna challenge you, I'm gonna confront you. You're wrong. Most of us are gonna start backing up. So we can speak the truth in love. What you say is very, very important. Look at number three. To be forgiving of him. Would you read Ephesians 4.32? Let's begin. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Wives, I want to encourage you to become experts in forgiving your husband. Why? If you don't, he won't want you to be his friend, and he won't want to be a friend to you. And if there isn't a friendship in the husband-wife relationship, needs are not going to get met. Isn't that right? Huh? Yeah. We call them intimate enemies. Oftentimes, husbands and wives function as enemies because they get their feelings hurt. And when your feelings are hurt and you move into unforgiveness and you become bitter, you no longer are interested in meeting your wife's needs. If she says, I need you to listen, you go, go get one of your besties. I'm not interested. And when that happens, the relationship is on a slow death spiral. On December the 6th, I'm going to close this series with a teaching entitled Choosing a Lifestyle of Forgiveness. Because forgiveness is everything. If I don't learn how to cancel the debt against my wife on a daily basis, we're going to lock each other out. I'm not going to treat her with unconditional love. I'm not going to meet her intimacy needs. And there's not a ghost of a chance my sexual needs being met. Now, this is simple. It's difficult to work. <laughs> okay? But this is pretty simple to understand this. Number four, your husband in friendship needs you to be honest with him. One thing I know about myself is that honesty is a major building block of a relationship. I need Kathy to be honest with me. If she hides things from me, if she does things behind my back, oh, we are not happy. And our relationship does not go well. Do you understand what I'm saying? And she'll say to me, well, I need you to make sure you handle your anger. Because if you get angry at me, I will be prone not to tell you the truth. Why do most of us lie? What, what is the driving force behind lying? Fear. Did you say that, Robin? You get a free brownie. Very good. Fear drives it. So men, when we're angry towards our wives, when we shut them out, they're going to be prone not to tell us the truth. And then as a hypocrite, I'm a hypocrite. If I treat my wife in an angry manner, and then out of fear she lies to me, and then I say, I will not stand for lying. Well, I have to take responsibility for not creating a safe environment. Honesty is, is important. Look at letter B. How do you meet your husband? Or how do you meet your male friend, friendship needs? Number one, let him know you want to be his best friend. As a woman, have you ever, have you ever said it to your husband? I want to be your best friend. I, it sounds simple. But I, I, I wonder, don't raise your hand, but I suspect in just a, a group this size, there's probably some of us here as women or men, we've never said to our spouses, I want you, I need you to be my best friend. Look at Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24. Would you read that with me? Let's begin. 
There are friends who destroy each other, but a real friend sticks closer than a brother. Most of us evangelicals read that and we go, oh, we know who that is. That's Jesus. That's not who that scripture is talking about. He's talking about real life relationships. In the Bible, in the Old Testament, it was a male-dominated culture. And men had a tendency. They had wives that they had expressed their sexual needs, but believe it or not, at times some of their most closest, intimate friends were men. Look at David and Jonathan. They went into battle together. If any of us are veterans, you know what, if you've been in, a, in the foxhole with somebody, uh, just in our uh, weekend with uh, veterans, I heard more veterans say, I am tied to that man for the rest of my life because we were, we were in the hole together. Bullets were flying over our heads. I will be indebted to him for the rest of my life. That's this kind of thing. This is the kind of relational need that we have. And a good place, women, to start, a good place, men, to start, is to simply express it to your wife or to your husband. I want to be your best friend. I know I'm a woman. I don't understand all of your things. Some of the things you do seem strange to me. But I want to be introduced to your world so I can understand because whether you know it or not, we have a need for best friends from our spouses. Look at number two. Be a safe person for your husband to feel his pain. The truth is this, women, that most of the men that you relate to are damaged inside. We're hurt. We're broken. We have traumas. For many of us, we might look like we're okay on the outside, but that little boy on the inside is very frightened. I remember when we moved to uh, Pomona. It was ranked the second worst city in America to, America to live in, in five different areas. One uh, had to do with uh, toxic material around there, had to do with uh, gang violence, had to do with drug infestation. And uh, Kathy and I were there, and it was a frightening time for her. But I remember Benjamin was about one. Uh, just a lot of my past father issues began to surface. Uh, I would spend two, three hours in my office just sobbing, uh, and I was depressed. I grew up in a Christian home, so I never had sex outside of marriage. I never drank, did not do drugs, did not steal. I mean, I was what you'd call a goody two white shoes kind of kid, okay? But I also believed that no matter how bad it got, you'd never, ever consider suicide. So it became a trap for me. Here I am a Christian. Here I know the answer is Jesus, but why was I depressed? Why did I feel like I was walking in total darkness and I couldn't get it figured out? And now here I am in the pastorate, still fighting the demons of my past. And Kathy, if it wasn't for Kathy's ability to be safe for me, she was... Uh, still breastfeeding Benny. And at times I'd walk in and there she was with him and I would be so broken up, I'd ask her, could I just sit on your lap? 210 pound male on this little fragile gal, you know? And so she had Benny in one hand and here's big lobster on the other side. And I'd just sit there and sob and she'd just hold me. If it wasn't for her tenderness, if it wasn't for her care, if it wasn't for her, you know, she could have said, you're a little too old for this, you big baby. You know, you're a man now. Get your act together. You need to provide. You need to take care of us. You need to protect us. I should be crying on your lap, not you crying on my lap, you big baby, you. If she had done that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have gotten healed. There is something profound in the healing process. God's power, 2 Corinthians says, is manifested in our weakness. And the problem most of us males is we're, we're very vigilant not to be weak in each other's presence. We want to show how big and strong we are. The truth is, when I'm hurting on the inside, I need my wife to be safe for me. I need other men that I have around me that can be safe. Number four, love him sacrificially. This is usually the battle in marriage. The wife says, I'm not meeting his needs until he meets mine. And the man says, I ain't meeting her needs until he meets mine. Well, welcome to divorce court, because that's where it's headed. Am I right? 
Yeah, it'll get cold, it'll get bitter, it will get resentful. You'll lock each other out emotionally, lock each other out sexually, lock each out financially, and then down the toilet it goes. So I understand women. It, this, what I'm saying to you is for men too, okay? The more you can love him sacrificially, the more you will speak to that broken aspect of him. He'll have his best chance of getting healed. 1 Peter 3, 9. Would you read that out loud with me? Let's begin. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That is what God has called you to do, and he will bless you for it. I know Peter was talking um, to uh, Christians who are being persecuted, but let's take this in a marriage, and you can apply it the same way. When you feel you're being persecuted by your intimate enemy, did you know God promotes payback? He does, but it's different than I. If I say I was going to pay Patty, Patty May back for what she did or said, it meant I was going to do her harm. If you take it from a Christ perspective, he says, I want you to pay Patty back. And you pay her back with a blessing. You add value to her life. You find something that's beneficial and be good to her. Everything within us says, are you kidding me? Kathy didn't meet my need. Why would I want to meet her need? Because that's the only way that sacrificial love manifests itself. That's how Jesus loves the church. Look at number four. How do you meet your husband's need, a man's need for encouragement? Look at letter A. Encourage him to hear the applause. For those men who have put their faith in Jesus Christ, there is an applause from heaven. Would you, women, are you aware of this, that as men, we're approval hungry? We desperately need approval. One of the best things you can do is to encourage your husband. I'm going to show you how to do that in a moment. To encourage him to hear God's approval and pleasure of him. And there's nothing quite like it when Kathy looks me in the eye or she takes my hand and she communicates that she's pleased with me. I know she's displeased with me a lot. I know that. She's been very faithful to let me know that. But it's something special when my counterpart, when my soulmate looks me in the eye and begins to tell me how pleasing I am to her. There's nothing I won't do for her when she communicates that to me. Because God has wired me that way. Women, he's wired your man that way. He seeks approval. Let him know that God approves of him. And let him know that you approve of him. Well, he's not approved worthy. Find something that you can approve and then approve it over and over and over again. What you approve will grow. That's pretty good, isn't it? Let's go to slide 25, what all? Letter B, let him know the ways you see God working in his life. Would you read with me Philippians 1, 6? Let's begin. And I am certain, would you read it with me? And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. The greatest encouragement you can give your man, your husband, your brother, your son is to tell him when you see God active in his life. When you see your man take a stand for what's right, when you see him reading his Bible, when he's praying, when he's sacrificing on the, behave, on the behalf of others. And I love this one. When you see the character of Jesus Christ, which is called the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, he lists nine of them. You look for in your husband, when you see him acting and growing in love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Just heap praise on him. When you see he used to spend a lot of money and he goes, you know, I'm not going to do that now. That's not what's best for our family. Boy, husband, I see the fruit of self-control growing in you. Or where maybe he would used to lash out at you and be angry. Nothing helps me more than when Kathy says, I see how you're growing in your patience. 
because I can have a short fuse. I'm really strange. I can have a long fuse on really big things, and then when the things that are not so important, I can have a tiny to no fuse. Anybody else like that? You know, the most stupid things, I can just go, ah! You know, and then somebody hit me with a truck, and I go, no, it's okay. Yeah, I don't know. Are you okay? You know, are you okay? I, it's just a strange thing. I'll have that short fuse. So when Kathy says, I see your fuse growing, what she's really saying is, you're becoming more like Jesus. Hallelujah. Your man needs to hear that. Number, letter C, support him having male friends that can hold him accountable. Look at the Ecclesiastes 4.12. Would you read that out loud with me? Let's begin. A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. First thing he's saying is that when you are living a life with others, it sure outweighs selfish individualism. When you've got two, you've got somebody to cover your back. But what's this three braid deal? What he's seeing is there is a proper complex of power in a three-stranded rope, provided that the strands are in good shape and they support one another. A three-stranded rope is almost impossible to break. What is the Bible saying? Your man needs to have at least two, if not three or more men in his life that he can share his failures, his flaws, his foibles. He can be honest about his hurts, his ha habits, and his hang-ups. That he can, I, I've got several men, when I sit them down, I say, I need to be weak in your presence for a moment. They shift because they know, they know what I need of them. They're not going to condemn me. They're not going to react and go, what in the heck were you thinking? They're going to sit and listen as I pour out my pain I pour out my hurt. And let me just say this. It's my job, it's your job as a man and as a woman to make sure you know what you need and then to say it to him. I, I was sharing my hurt with a guy and he started to try to fix me and I said, I'm so sorry. Would you stop? I failed to tell you what I needed. Can we back up? He goes, sure, okay. Don't say anything this time, just listen. Let me get it out. I'm fairly sharp. Half the time, if you just let me pour my heart out, I will get the conclusions. I will get what I need. But then oftentimes I'll say, okay, thank you for listening. Now would you give me your input? Very important. And D, encourage him to connect with your children. Kathy, uh, and I, I haven't firmed you enough on this because I'll take it as nagging, and it, it really isn't. Kathy is marvelous in making sure she keeps track of my relationship with Whitney and Benny. And she'll go, have you talked to Whitney lately? Or, you know, what you said at the table was really inappropriate. I think you need to make it right. I don't like it when she says it. I resent it half the time. But she's always right. Usually. Most of the time you're right on that. So, again, you don't want to nag. But you can continue to encourage your man he needs his children as much as they need him and to stay in right relationship. She's been just marvelous with Benjamin and Whitney that way, and even people in church will go, have you talked to such and such? No, she did it the other day, just said, what about something? I said, yeah, you're right, you know, and I got up and I made the phone calls, and it was good that I did. So we need to encourage that connection. Then we'll close with this, number five. How do you meet your husband's needs for spiritual connecting? There's four quick ways. First of all, pray for his personal time reading God's word. This can be your boyfriend. This can be your dad, your grandson. Just a man you know. He doesn't even have to be a believer. Start praying that he would have an insatiable hunger and desire for the word of God. Encourage him to get a Bible bookmark and start reading through the Bible with us. Look at letter B. Encourage his prayer life. And what I mean by that is that he'll learn to talk to God on a daily basis, um, at work, under stress, in anxiety, all these different things, just in pray that God will draw him into that kind of relationship or conversation. Look at letter C. His relationships with other men who are pursuing spiritual growth. And let me just do a quick ad for this 
Saturday the 19th. Every man, please look at me and listen to me, okay? The 19th, we have uh, our icon ministry in the company of men. Uh, we start, we, we've started a 16-week deal. You could check with Peter. Uh, I still think if you got involved now, even though we're six, seven weeks, in, this stuff is just life-changing. It's profound. And we go from 8 to 9.30. Then we're going to have a men's breakfast. We'd love to have you come. Please let us know. Fill out the connection card. We need to know if you're coming, so we make sure that we have enough food. And that's going to be from 9.30 to 10.30. Then from 10.30 to 2 or 3, if you uh, are able-bodied and you can help, uh, we're going to do some projects around the church and we'll start, okay? But wives, women, encourage your men to become a part of this. Uh, you've got to be around other men so you can s- try to start a relationship. And then look at letter D. Develop a lifestyle of giving. I'm a giving person, but Kathy makes me even a better giver. And here's the four areas, five areas, that you can encourage your man to be a giver. Giving of his time. How can he give his time to others? His talents. Hey, Scott, you can use your talents to touch these people. Your treasure. This is your finances. There was a season in our lives eight, nine years ago, Kathy had to say, Scott, you're getting a little stingy here. You know, and and now it's not that way, but she was very helpful to me. And then your touch. Even just your physical touch. Making sure that you're touching other people in appropriate ways and giving life touch away. Once you develop a giving lifestyle, you will see really just how true this is. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for your word this, this afternoon. I thank you for these dear ones. Lord, this 1145 service is going to be a great one. And I pray, Lord, that you would just speak to each one of us about inviting our fam- friends and family, people that we don't know, to come and, and be a part of a group of people that are wanting to get to know you and getting to know each other better. I continue to pray your healing, restoration, and power in all of our relationships, Lord. And I pray specifically that us men will tune in to our wives and our daughters and the women that we relate to, tune in to their needs and learn to meet them in appropriate ways. And that Father, that wives will be willing to master their husband's needs. And Lord, we'll see our marriages, we'll see family life flourish. It's a new, new question.